Welcome to COSH training for Bradford Teaching Hospitals. This video provides a basic overview of the requirements of the COSH Regulations 2002 as amended and the basics of controlling and hopefully reducing risks to staff, patients and visitors from substances considered to be hazardous to health. This will be useful for all members of staff as a standalone video. However, it is also a part one in a three-part training package to allow you to successfully become a COSH assessor for your ward or department. Staff who aren't training to become COSH assessors just need to watch this video. Staff training to become COSH assessors will need to watch the second video based around how to use a SIPOL COSH management system and undergo an assessment. Details about these aspects can be found on the COSH intranet site. So we'll start with the regulations. The Control of Substances Hazardous to Health Regulations 2002, as amended, referred to more commonly as COSH require employers and employees to play their part in ensuring the workplace is as safe as possible. While employers are expected to put into place as many reasonable precautions as possible to protect staff, patients and visitors, each and every employee also has a responsibility to ensure that they read cost assessments for any substances they use in their work before they use them, follow any instructions provided, use safety equipment where necessary and remain vigilant to other risks which they should then report to their managers to ensure that these can also be reviewed. The way any employer handles COSH is subject to review and scrutiny by the Health and Safety Executive, the HSE, and you can find lots of useful refer reference sources on their website if you'd like more information about COSH in general, including controlling the risks. As well as the national regulations, we have a trust COSH policy, which can be found on the internet. This details the roles and responsibilities of different staff within the Trust. You should familiarise yourself with the content of this policy, particularly if you are training to become a COSH assessor. One of the first things that we need to consider when looking at COSH is what is actually covered by the regulations? What can be considered a hazardous substance? Most people think of chemicals or products containing chemicals, which is correct. But COSH also incorporates microbiological hazards um, and asphyxiating gases such as nitrogen. People often also think of liquids as posing a COSH risk, which is true. But in fact, these substances in any form can be considered under the COSH regulations. Powders, vapours, tablets, creams and so on. One way to help determine if something is considered a hazardous substance is to check the safety data sheet supplied with it. If a data sheet is not supplied, these are easy to obtain from the manufacturer, usually via their website, but you can also call or email the manufacturer to ask to be sent a copy. Another place to check is the EH40 guidance document. This can be found on the HSE website and is free to download. You can search this document for your substance and if it is listed with a workplace exposure limit, you can, expose a, uh, you can assume that this substance should be managed under the COSH regulations. It's important to be aware of sensitising substances too, such as latex and antibiotics. These substances may not immediately pose an obvious hazard, but low level exposure over a long period of time can make people more likely to develop an allergic reaction to them. This is a particular concern with healthcare staff and latex, so wherever possible use latex free alternatives, even if nobody in the area has a known latex allergy. There are also some hazardous substances not covered by the COSH regulations, and this is because they have specific regulations of their own. These substances are lead, asbestos and radioactive substances. These do still pose a risk to health, so it is still important to ensure that they are properly controlled in your work area, and you should escalate any concerns around these substances to your manager. So when reviewing COSH risks, it's important to consider the ways in which someone could be harmed by the substance that you've identified as hazardous. For example, when handling medication according to procedure, a nurse is unlikely to ingest a liquid medicine and suffer the known side effects of taking that medicine. But they may knock a bottle over and they and their colleagues may then be splashed by the liquid or inhale any vapours from a particularly volatile substance such as an anaesthetic. You also need to consider the other people in your environment. For example, on a paediatric ward, is a substance presented in a brightly coloured bottle which might invoke a child's curiosity and invite them to investigate further by picking it up and playing with it, and perhaps drinking it. In which case, ingestion may be a very real risk that you should consider. 
The same substance in the estate's office may be more likely to pose a risk from being spilled than from ingestion. So now that we've identified the potential risks in our local area, we need to look at assessing these, trying to reduce them, and once they've been reduced and mitigated as much as possible, accepting any residual risks. So then we need to determine the risk. And this section builds on from what we've already considered in relation to risk. We've worked out what might cause harm and how that harm might be caused. Now we need to determine the real risk of that harm occurring. How likely is it to happen? You should consider the form of the substance, by which we mean is it a powder, a liquid or a gas? Solid substances such as tablets are much easier to control and contain than liquids, powders or gases. Powders and gases are particularly difficult to manage as they can very easily be dispersed into the air from where they can be inhaled, so they usually pose a higher risk. Then think about how much of the substance is being used. Is it a tiny amount used rarely, or is it something which may be used in litres at a time? Is it bulky and difficult to carry, in which case it may be more likely to be dropped and spilled? What is the environment like where it's usually used? Is it well ventilated, perhaps with extraction, such as a fume cupboard or an anaesthetic gas scavenging system? Or is it in a confined area which doesn't even have an opening window? Also think about how many people are in the vicinity. Is this a process which takes place in an open, uncontrolled area where lots of people are frequently passing? Or does it have a dedicated space for a specific activity where it can be closed off to protect others from exposure? In addition, some individuals may be at higher risk than others. The risk of children or vulnerable adults being exposed to substance should be considered. Also, pregnant women or people with respiratory conditions can often be at greater risk from some commonly used hazardous substances. So consider your usual patient population, particularly in outpatient areas. Don't forget to think about visitors and contractors too. You can't plan for every scenario, but you should try and anticipate the most likely risks for your area. And now that we have a good grasp of what we're working with, we can really focus on reducing that risk and the regulations state that we should be aiming to get the risk as low as reasonably practicable. This can be achieved using the seven steps for good control practice, which we will look at next. The first step in good control practice is eliminate. It sounds obvious, but think about whether you really need to use the substance at all. Particularly if it's something you've been using for a long while, there may be newer, safer alternatives available, which are just as effective as your current product. Scan the market to see what's available and switch it if you can. It might even be possible to stop using any hazardous substance entirely. The second step is to try and use a safer form of the substance. We've touched on this already, but think about whether you can use a safer form. For example, is the powder substance that you currently use available as a liquid instead, or even better, a solid form such as a tablet? Perhaps you can get a ready-to-use substance which is less concentrated than something that you currently dilute at the point of use. Step three is to think about the process. It's worth taking the time to review your current processes. For example, can they be changed to use less of the hazardous substance? Can you remove a dilution stage? Can the process be shortened so that the amount of time an individual is exposed to the hazard is reduced? This will be different for everyone and it would be a good idea to talk to the people closely involved in the process to see if they have any suggestions to make it safer. It's also really important to document the process so that all staff know exactly what to do and that they all do it in the same way consistently each time. Procedures should be in date and easily accessible at all times. The fourth step is to try and enclose the process. We've already briefly mentioned this, but can you find a way or a space to reduce the number of people who might be exposed, perhaps by creating a dedicated area, or just putting a sign on the door for a short time while the work is being done, asking people not to enter until you've finished? This obviously needs to be balanced against the need for adequate ventilation whilst undertaking the process. Step five is to extract emissions where appropriate. It is possible and sometimes necessary to extract the emissions from a process, for example using an anaesthetic gas scavenging system in theatres or fume cupboards in the labs. In the pharmacy they use a very small version of a fume cupboard to extract the powder release when making up antibiotic liquids. 
If you think this may be necessary for your work area, speak to Estates or the Pharmacy QA team for further advice. If you already have extract in place, it's important to ensure that it's serviced annually and you can discuss this further with Estates as well. Step 6 is based around minimising exposure. You should make an active attempt to reduce the number of people in the area who may be in harm's way. For example, using temporary signage to direct them away from the process, restricting access or even choosing to undertake the work at a time when less people are likely to be affected. For example, at weekends or during a known quiet period. Step 7 is personal protective equipment, also known as PPE. When people think of COSH, this is often the first thing they think of, usually gloves and an apron, perhaps goggles too. And to some extent, it's good that people do automatically think about what protection they should be using. However, it's the last step in our seven steps of good control practice for a reason. PPE is only as good as the person using it. People are different, both different from each other and different in themselves day to day. So it's difficult to be assured that something which relies on people using it properly will always provide the optimum level of safety. This is why the other six steps are so important. The end user doesn't need to know about all of the other aspects we've considered, but as an organisation and as cautious assessors, we need to know that we've done everything we can to build safety into the design of the process and the system so that PPE can be our final barrier. We then need to make it as easy as possible for PPE to be effective for example, if gloves are needed, make sure that they're easily accessible and available in a range of sizes to fit everyone who might need them. If your PPE is reusable, make sure there's a good programme for decontamination, repair and checking for faults, rips and holes and so on. If your PPE is complicated, perhaps a respirator hood for example, ensure that the instructions for use are readily available and ensure that staff receive regular training on its use. If PPE is recommended, even if you think it's the most basic level, so gloves and an apron perhaps, it's still important to show that staff receive the right training and to ensure that they do know how to use it confidently and correctly. These seven steps to control require a lot of decisions to be made and may need procedures to be written or training to be delivered. As a cautious assessor, you're not expected to do all of that on your own. Your primary role is to assess the risk and provide recommendations to the manager of the area or department as to how they can reduce or control the risk. Once you think the risk is as low as is reasonably practicable, it's time to submit your information onto the CIPOL CMS system online. There's a separate training video for this, but in short, you'll submit all of your information to the team of experts behind CIPOL CMS and within five days, they will return a completed risk assessment to you. You should review this, consider any actions which need to be implemented, and then refer the assessment to a department manager or matron for a final review and sign off. The manager will then review the risk assessment and ensure that all recommended actions can be put into place if they aren't already. It may be that on some occasions, it's not possible to put these risk reduction measures in place perhaps because they would have a detrimental impact elsewhere, on patient care perhaps, or they're not financially viable. In these instances, the manager can document the reasons for not taking all recommended precautions and accept the residual risk. And this may involve speaking to the appropriate governance groups. It should be noted that the risk assessment, once returned from CIPOL, also contains actions to be taken in an emergency, such as fire or spillage. Check these to make sure that you can comply with those and have appropriate spillage kits available, for example. Once approved, the COSH assessor should print off a copy of the COSH assessment and place, place it in the department's COSH folder with the associated safety data sheet from the product manufacturer. It is important that this folder is up to date and readily accessible to all staff at all times. So We've already touched on this, but training is a really important aspect of COSH management and risk reduction. At the very least, all staff should be aware of the COSH regulations, their obligations under the Trust COSH policy and where to find risk assessments. Staff should all also be aware not to use or handle any substance unless they've read the COSH risk assessment and that they understand how to use the substance safely, which may require more detailed training. In this case, it's important to maintain staff training records. As mentioned already, any necessary procedures or instructions should be in date and readily available to staff at all times. 
Some substances may need to have their levels in the environment monitored. Such substances usually have a workplace exposure limit, which is defined in the EH40 document mentioned earlier. If you are working with one of these substances, the first thing to do is to work out if you are likely to be using enough of the substance for it to be anywhere near that limit. If you calculate how much you use in a session and compare it to the published limits in EH40, this should give you some idea. There are very few substances we use in the trust which are near this limit. One of those is nitrous oxide, and for this reason, areas of maternity and some theatres are routinely monitored to ensure that staff aren't exposed to too much during their work. If you think your area should be monitored and you aren't sure if you're on the schedule, contact Pharmacy QA for advice. If you think you're using another substance with a workplace exposure limit and you've calculated that you may use enough of the substance to be near that limit, contact Pharmacy QA for further advice. We can support you to obtain the appropriate testing if necessary. Health surveillance may be necessary to ensure that staff do not become unwell during the course of their duties and this is managed by the Health and Wellbeing Service. All staff complete a questionnaire on employment which should flag up any potential issues such as respiratory conditions which can then be monitored by the Health and Wellbeing team. In addition, initiatives such as the annual Hand Skin Health Survey distributed throughout the Trust allows Health and Wellbeing to get some vital data on staff health. If your assessment suggests that health surveillance may be needed, contact the Health and Wellbeing Service for further advice. The CIPOL CMS system will alert you when current assessments are due for review. High risk substances need annual review, while lower risk substances require a review less often. When you review the substances, you should always start at step one of good control practice and work your way through all seven steps. You should also review your cost assessments immediately if there are any changes, such as changes in the process or a change in how often you use a substance or how much of it you use. New substances should be assessed immediately and added onto the CIPOL CMS system before they are used in the ward or department. If you stop using a substance, this should be archived on the CIPOL CMS system and placed into the archive section of your paper folder. Congratulations! You have now completed part one of COSH Assessor Training. Go to the COSH internal web pages to access the second part of the training and the um, assessment that you will need. If you pass the assessment, you'll be issued with login details for the CIPOL CMS system. You should then be able to start undertaking cautious assessments for your area.